Okay, in this video I'm going to provide a discussion and demonstration of invariance testing in the context of confirmatory factor analysis where we are using the AMOS program to test for measurement invariance across groups. Uh, the issue of me measurement er uh, invariance is important because uh, oftentimes we find ourselves wanting to compare uh, groups um, on measures of, um, of the same construct and we may be interested in testing for mean differences but um, if the if the um, measures are getting at different things within different groups then it becomes difficult to talk about um, differences in terms of means on uh, those measures so um, invariance testing can be really handy in terms of determining whether or not a um, measurement instrument is is uh, essentially uh, functioning equivalently uh, across different population samples so um, in this particular demonstration right here this is partially derived uh, or heavily influenced by a uh, presentation in Barbara Burns book uh, where she discusses measurement invariance and uh, I actually downloaded the data set uh, from her website and this is actually a subset of the items that are included in her model but she's essentially looking at uh, items that are measuring three different facets of depression uh, symptoms which include uh, negative attitudes, performance difficulty, and somatic complaints and um, so you can see that these um, factors are uh, correlated in the model and we also have correlated errors as well and so what we're going to do is we're going to test this model um, uh, across two groups to determine if the um, if the uh, items are really essentially functioning in the same way so um, in terms of measuring their respective constructs uh, like I said, this is a subset of the items that are actually in her presentation, so um, we're just working with that because there are a lot of items that she included in, in, the, uh, in her demonstration, and it just ends up filling up a lot of the space and um, making it a little bit harder to, um, to, to see. So at any rate, um, we have data from two groups. Uh, we have group one with uh, uh, responses to the uh, items, and then we have uh, data from group two as well. And um, the first step when it comes to invariance testing uh, is essentially testing for configural invariance. And what that basically is getting at is uh, the question of whether um, it really kind of pertains to the issue of whether the same general specification of the model um, holds across groups. So you'll notice that we have items 1, 2, and 3 loaded onto negative attitudes, 4, 11, and 12 loaded onto performance difficulty, 11, 15, uh, items 15, 16, and 18 loading onto somatic complaints. We have correlated uh, factors and then a few correlated errors. And so the basic idea is that uh, if we have a model with configural invariance, then this general specification should exhibit a reasonably good fit uh, within each individual group. Um, now, it's also possible that uh, you would have configural non-invariance, and what, what that could be manifest uh, as, as maybe uh, we might have uh, in one group, maybe the three-factor correlated errors model uh, might make sense, um, whereas maybe uh, in another group we should just have a single factor with uh, errors pointing to all of the items and just uh, treating it as a, a single factor model. Uh, that might be one example, or it might be a, a simpler um, example might be where uh, in one group this specification holds, but then in another group maybe item two has a complex loading onto uh, negative attitude um, onto negative attitudes and performance difficulties. So essentially if the configuration holds across groups and that would be evidence of configural invariance and then the next step is going through and testing for uh, invariance in terms of the parameter estimates if, if the configural invariance holds. So what we're going to do um, in this case is we're going to start by looking at configural invariance just testing the general model in each group. So I've got the general uh, configuration here and I'm going to go into uh, data files. I've already selected um, my um, data file. I'm going to click on OK. Um, standard things that I would ask for include standardized estimates, squared multiple correlations, and so forth. Uh, and then I'm going to click on Calculate Estimates. So 
when I click here and look at the uh, general model fit, you can see uh, that in terms of, and I'm going to mainly focus in on the CFI and RMSEA and TLI, but you can see that the CFI is 0.9, roughly 0.96, TLI is uh, 0.92. Uh, you can see that the uh, uh, goodness of fit, adjusted goodness of fit ind indices are um, uh, in the 0.9s. RMSEA is a little bit on the high side at uh, 0 0.079. So, um, you know, it's not the greatest fitting model in the world, but um, it's it's um, it's fitting okay. Um, when we look at the individual estimates, we can see that. All of our um, specified uh, loadings are uh, statistically significant in the model, um, and uh, you, so you can see that we have our um, individual loadings, and uh, these are the unstandardized factor loadings. Remember that uh, when we're specifying a CFA model, we have to scale the latent variables. Uh, we can either do that by um, or setting the scale by either uh, um, uh, fixing the uh, variance of the latent variables to one, or we can set um, the uh, scale of the variable in relation to a single indicator variable. So in this case, I've set the scale in relation to item one, and so I fixed that path coefficient to one. So that's why um, all of the um, um, paths that are fixed to one to scale the latent variables, none of them have a significance test associated with them. So um, at any rate, Next, what we'll do is we are just going to uh, run the same model in group two. So I'm going to go back, run it in group two, click on open, and so there it is. It says group two right here. Click on OK, and then run the model, and look at its fit. And so the model fit, you can see, you know, the CFI is 0.945 here. You can see it's a little bit lower on the TLI. Um, GFI, AGFI is, um, you know, in the 0.9s. Um, and then probably, I'm going to assume, uh, which uh, is indeed the case, RMSCA is 0 .086, so it's, uh, it's on the high side as well. Uh, I'll be honest, I think uh, in the original presentation uh, uh, with all of the items and, and her specification in the book, uh, things fit better than what we have uh, in this particular case. But let's just, for argument's sake, assume that uh, the model was fitting um, um, as well or better in both groups and um, and and we'll assume that the configural uh, invariance uh, question holds. So it, it does appear to generally be uh, fitting uh, similarly across groups in terms of the configural arrangement but you know we have we haven't actually explored the possibility of other um, specifications as well you know for instance you know maybe in one group we might need to add in an additional path um, uh, from a factor to a, a given indicator variable whereas in another group it might be different so um, if we make the assumption uh, that the uh, that the configuration uh, seems to reasonably hold across groups then the next uh, step is to test for um, invariance in terms of the um, individual uh, parameters within the model. So uh, to do this, what we have to do is set up a multi-group model. And so we'll go to um, uh, analyze, we'll go to um, essentially manage groups, and you'll see that when we click on this, we have group one, and we can name it. We can, you know, if this was, uh, you know, males or something like that, we could do that. I'm just going to stick with group one uh, here and uh, click on new and then we'll have group number two and we can name that if we want so I'll just I'm just gonna leave that alone and so when I filled that in you know you can see group one group two uh, highlighted right here so once that appears up here we can click on close and now we'll go to our select data files and group one I'm just gonna go ahead and select group one here and then for group two we'll select it uh, right here we'll click on open <clears throat> and so now you can see that we have the separate data files in each group. So uh, we have a pretty large uh, samples for represented representing uh, uh, the two groups. Next, we'll click on OK, and so we're we're basically kind of ready to go. So if I if I just run the analysis from this point, what I'll end up with, if you look at uh, under uh, the uh, model fit, this is basically kind of um, uh, looking at the configural arrangement across groups and allowing the uh, estimates uh, within each group to be uh, freely estimated. So in other words, the parameters 
are being uh, estimated um, uh, freely in each group. So if I look, um, so if if the if this, the configural model holds, uh, then then again that would be kind of evidence that we have um, a good a good general uh, model. So um, you can see right here that uh, we have the CFI uh, TLI. You know, again, a pretty decent CFI TLIs on the low side. Um, if we go down and we look at the um, RMSEA, it's a, it's actually a little bit better here, 0 0.06. Um, but uh, you know, basically, uh, what we've done is we've tested the configuration in Group One and Group Two, and now this is essentially what's called an unconstrained model, where we've freely estimated the parameters within each group, and so we're sort of pooling the general fit across those two groups. Um, so, like I said, this is an unconstrained model where we have not constrained any of the parameters to equality, uh, and that will be sort of a next step. Uh, if we look under estimates, and you can see down here we've got uh, group one. So, if I, you know, you can see here it says uh, estimates group one, so regression weights for group one, standardized weights for group one, and so forth. Uh, if we want to look at group two's estimates, here they are. So, you can see that when we click back and forth, the uh, the estimates change as well as you know whatever the significance levels but you can see that all of the paths were statistically significant in uh, each of the two groups so you know we do have s evidence that at least in terms of the configuration that um, it's 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 um, pretty decent although like I said we might have actually spent a little bit more time investigating other possible configurations to see if there were, might have been a better one for each group but if we decided on the same configuration for each group, then we move to the step of, uh, of testing um, uh, by uh, uh, testing uh, individual parameters for, um, for um, invariance. So at this point, um, let's go to analyze. And uh, you know, in terms of in, uh, testing the individual parameters, there, there are a couple of different ways that we could do this uh, through the AMOS program. Probably the simplest approach um, and the most efficient approach is to essentially test a set of parameters that are reflecting, uh, you know, all at the same time, uh, and then adding in constraints. So the basic idea is is that, um, like for instance, if I want to test the um, the, um, the the factor loadings within the model across uh, the two groups, what I could do is I could fix my loadings um, that you have right here. Uh, to equality between the two groups, um, and then if um, if the fit of the model decreases significantly relative to that unconstrained model, then I could actually go back and go through a series of testing each individual path uh, to determine uh, you know which ones are contributing to um, um, the uh, the significant decrease in fit, and by doing that, um, you know we can identify which paths ought to be uh, treated as um, as non-invariant, uh, meaning that they should be allowed to be freely estimated between the groups. Whereas, um, if we find that there's uh, no significant decrease in fit um, by um, by reduce by uh, constraining a, a, a loading to equality, then that would indicate that we have invariance. In which case, then we would want to um, constrain that loading to equality. So we can also follow the same process with respect to um, you know this kind of structural portion of the model in terms of the residuals and also the variances if we want. So the the most efficient way of doing this, or um, in my opinion, is it to go through analyze go through the multiple group analysis option so if you click on this this is not an error you'll just click on the OK button right here and so the program already identifies um, you know several different models so we have model 1, model 2, model 3 model 1 is the measurement weights model and that's actually testing for invariance uh, between groups um, for the full slate of uh, factor loadings model 2 uh, incorporates um, uh, equality constraints um, across groups for the, the the factor loadings, but then adds in equality constraints for uh, the variances and the covariances among the latent variables. Model three adds in uh, 
uh, the measurement residuals portion as well, and it constrains the measure the uh, the uh, residuals uh, to equality as well as the covariances. So, like I said, this is kind of a, a nice way of quickly identifying uh, where there might be sources of invariance. Um, um, are, are non-invariance between groups across the, a set of parameters and then you can kind of if you determine that let's say uh, the model one decreases significant uh, re represents a significant decrease in fit relative to the unconstrained model then you could go back and test the individual paths but if it's if it's not a significant decrease in fit then we would want to uh, leave uh, the measurement weights constrained and then test to see if the, the structural covariances portion um, uh, if we add those uh, constraints does that yield a signif significant decrease in fit and if it does uh, then then we would want to go through and test and if not then we would um, we would uh, constrain that portion and then so forth so I'm going to click on OK and so now you can see that Amos goes about the process of naming uh, each individual parameter in the model and so if you go back and forth between group 1 and group 2 you can see that the same general name is given but but the uh, underscore 1 and 2 is, is reflecting the group number so now you can see it says unconstrained measurement weight structural co covariances and measurement residuals so I'm going to click on this little calculate estimate but button right here and if I go click on this button right here you can see that we have um, you know group one group two and so essentially when you click back and forth you can see that essentially all of the parameters um, in terms of the unstandardized estimates are changing with the exception of the the, the ones that are fixed um, uh, the paths that are fixed at one uh, as, as well as the uh, paths from the uh, error term so all that that so the unconstrained model allows all of the um, uh, the factor loadings except those that are fixed um, to be freely estimated as well as the variances, covariances of the uh, factors uh, and of the measurement errors. Also if we go back to standardized estimates and go back and forth you can see um, you know the same uh, general uh, notion. So next we'll go to measurement weights and so here we're going to constrain all of these to equality between the two groups. So if I click you know back and forth between group one and group two you can see that you know the uh, loadings are all the same between groups, but um, but the the factor variances and covariances and measurement errors and and uh, measurement covariances are all uh, freely estimated. If we go to structural covariances and go back and forth between the two groups, you can see that now these uh, the var factor variances and covariances are constrained to equality. And then the measurement residuals portion is the most restrictive model. And you know, if we go back and forth, you don't see anything in the model change. So you can see that essentially um, the unconstrained model is the most general model. Um, and then we're just uh, essentially adding in uh, equality constraints for a set of parameters uh, at each step. And then we can uh, determine whether or not we want to go, uh, you know, kind of investigate further by testing each individual parameter. So let's go to view text, and so now you can see um, when we go here, we'll go under um, uh, you know there's the model fit summary uh, information, and um, and uh, but you know mainly we're going to go to model comparison. So you can see uh, right here that we have comparisons between the different models. So you can see the first one it says assuming unconstrained model is correct. So that's the most general model. And uh, in that particular case, um, you know, uh, uh, we have a chi-square uh, test uh, that reflects the change in fit relative to that unconstrained model. So, uh, if this this is the chi-square difference um, test, and so if the chi-square value um, that you obtain is non-significant, which it is in this case, then that would actually be evidence that the configuration, uh, or excuse me, the the factor loadings in this case. Um, should be constrained to equality. Um, so in other words, that makes the assumption that um, across the two groups, the factor loadings are equal. Um, so then, assuming that that model is correct, we can go to the measurement, um, uh, assume we can look at this model where we have structural covariances. And so if this model right here is um, not significant, then that would indicate that we have 
uh, equivalence in terms of the factor variances and covariances between the groups. Um, and so that appears to be the case here. And then theoretically, the most constrained uh, or most restrictive model is one where we have constrained the measurement residuals and the covariances, the variances of the measurement residuals and the covariances to equality. And so you can see that there is a significant decrease in fit relative um, to the structural covariances model that we had right here. So there does look to be perhaps some um, some uh, non-invariance with respect to the measurement residuals. Uh, I will say that it's oftentimes not feasible to expect that level of equality um, between groups um, and, and oftentimes uh, you know, what we're mainly interested in is kind of determining whether that measurement portion uh, in terms of the factor loadings are equivalent between the groups. But, um, you know, this is kind of a short demonstration and I can't get into all the discussions about, um, you know, every uh, nuance behind the, the process, but that's um, behind this, this particular uh, topic. But, uh, you know, that's just kind of illustrating uh, sort of stepwise how to go about it. You'll notice that uh, really quickly, if uh, the measurement weights, if let's say this was significant, then what we would want to do is to investigate which factor loadings um, is producing uh, the significant finding. Because essentially, if this is significant, then what that means is that uh, by imposing equality constraints on the factor loadings between the two groups, that we would have a significant decrease in fit relative to the unconstrained model. So if that's the case, then we would want to identify which of those loadings uh, is producing the, uh, the decrement in fit. Um, and then the same general process would go about. We would, uh, um, you know, if we if we saw that uh, this model yielded a significant de decrease in fit, then we would want to look for uh, sources of non-invariance between the groups in terms of the uh, factor uh, variances and covariances. So, um, so it's obvious that we, you know, the, the basic model it looks like uh, that the loadings themselves should be treated as um, equivalent between the two groups. But let's just say, for argument's sake, that uh, they that they weren't. Uh, one strategy that you could adopt is, um, you know, when you is to go to the manage models uh, button right here, and um, you know you can see right here I've you know you've got unconstrained measurement weights, structural covariances, and measurement residuals. I found a handy way of doing things is just to go to the measurement weights model and uh, kind of copy this uh, off and then create a new model. So I'm going to go to model name and uh, we'll, we'll go with the um, uh, and I'll just give it a name. Sometimes I'll just name the individual parameter just to say this is what's being compared. So let's say we've got A1 right here. So I can just kind of highlight this and uh, delete everything else. And so this is essentially a test. I'll, I'll generate um, a chi-square difference test um, looking at the degree of uh, uh, reduction in fit uh, by adding in an equality constraint between group uh, 1 and group 2 with respect to the A1 parameter. Um, then I can do the same thing for um, you know the second one. Um, you know, as you can see right here, and then you know, do a new one. Uh, by the same token, you know, I don't have to do it that way. I can certainly you know search it out in here. If I go under weights, uh, there's three one, and um, you know, so I can just kind of you know note that one right there and say equals, and then three two. So I can you know double click and do that. I just find it a little quicker just to do it uh, this way. I, I tend to prefer to. You know, just do a little copying and uh, deleting. So there's A4, there's A5, uh, A5, and uh, A6. So you see that right there. Okay, so now I'm, so you can see that by adding in each model, you'll see that those names appear over here. So now when I click close, and if I run my analysis, you'll see that um, when I go into my output file, you'll see um, the model fit um, for, you know, essentially each of the models. And by the way, I didn't show this to you previously, but basically the model fit summary is just the fit of each, you know, you have uh, fit indices for each individual model. So 
we had the unconstrained model. That was the first one that we tested. Uh, the measurement weights model, you know, there's our um, you know, chi-square and degrees of freedom ratio for that one as well. Um, the structural covariances model and the measurement residuals model. Uh, we have you know the the AGFI, GFI, and so forth for those models. If we scroll down, and and so you can see we have the models with just one parameter that is constrained to equality. Um, so the A1 through A6 models are here, and um, so you can see that we have fit statistics for uh, each of the models that are generated. Here are the RMSCAs for all of our models. And so we'll go under model comparison, and so now you can see that, uh, you know, like I said, if this model was um, had indicated statistical significance, then we would want to look at the individual uh, path coefficients and determine which ones are contributing to the lack of fit. So we could, you know, so essentially the A1 model, it, you know, would be essentially a comparison. Um, uh, a model comparison where we have an unconstrained model except for this parameter here that is constrained between the two groups and then if this uh, significance test uh, you know if our uh, chi-square difference test yielded a significant uh, indicated a significant difference and that would tell us then that A1 uh, is not invariant um, uh, between the two groups and in fact uh, A1 uh, that that, that particular factor loading should be freely estimated between the two groups. So we would um, we would relax that constraint. Then for A2, um, kind of moving forward, then with respect to A2, we would do the same thing. Let's say that this one is not significant, um, at, you know, as you can see right here, then that would tell us then that we should be treating this parameter as equal between the two groups. Um, and so in other words, we would have evidence of invariance there. So that's essentially the process. Obviously, because we didn't have a significant decrease in fit by, um, constra by uh, constraining all of the paths to, um, to equality between the groups, then there's no need to do that. But you can see that we, can, we have essentially a test for each individual um, uh, parameter. And, and the same basic process would go um, um, you know, if we look at uh, the next uh, set, you can see. Let's say, let's say that this model holds, um, and so we should assume equal um, uh, path, co uh, path coefficients or factor loads between the two groups. Then we could also uh, look here and you know see if there's any kind of significant difference. And then, you know, if 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 we see a significant decrease in fit relative to the to uh, this model right here, then we would uh, go through the same process, uh, managing models, and then uh, you know doing that that kind of testing. Um, a much simpler way <laughs> that I found um, is to essentially um, when you run your analysis. Um, Instead of going through and and uh, imposing all of those constraints, um, I'm actually going to go back here and reopen this. Uh, uh, another option would be to, uh, under analysis properties, is click on critical ratios for differences. Um, so, you know, basically, I'm going to click on that, and I'm going to go back to analyze and go to uh, the multiple group and um, click on it and so we'll still get our same uh, general tests uh, that you see right here for each of those uh, parameters uh, or each configure um, each set of parameters excuse me so when we run the analysis we still have all the same information that we had uh, before we had the model comparisons and so forth and then based off of this we could actually go a little bit further if we go to pairwise parameter comparisons you'll see that we have the names for each of the of the uh, parameters so you can see for group one it's a11 uh, and then for group two it's a1 underscore two uh, and so rather than having to go through the manage models option like I just kind of showed you earlier a simpler way of doing things is just to look at these are basically critical ratios for testing differences between parameters um, and so you can see right here we have A11 uh, right here and if I scroll down and find the corresponding A12 let's see if I can find it here yeah there's A12 you can see that uh, the critical ratio is 0.151 so the critical ratio is basically a Z value and if, if uh, that um, uh, Z value uh, that you observe in your um, in this table falls uh, 
um, outside of the range of negative uh, 1.96 to 1.96, uh, you know, we're essentially assuming a two-tailed test with alpha at 0.05, then we would, um, if it falls outside that bounce, then we would reject the null and we would infer that there's a difference between the groups in terms of that parameter. Uh, in this case, you can see that there's no difference between the two groups because 1 point, or 0.15 uh, obviously falls uh, with uh, between negative 1.96 and positive 1.96. Um, and you can see that the organization 2.1, parameter 2.1, and uh, parameter, um, it's a little hard to find sometimes, but there's 2.2, so there it is. So you can see that if we kind of follow this diagonal right here, you can see that all of these critical ratios for each individual parameter, all the uh, uh, factor loading, all the way up to uh, loading number 6, um, there's no evidence of any kind of difference. Um, and then the same general process would hold for the other things. So like uh, the CCC11 uh, that you see in this model right here. Uh, let's see if I can find it. Um, let's see, it's CCC, yeah. CCC, uh, there's the CCC12. Again, there's CCC11, which is group one. So if you look right there, uh, for CCC11 and then you kind of scroll down and find the corresponding uh, version for group 2 which is going to be right here you can see that uh, the critical ratio is uh, indicating that there's no significant difference with respect to the covariance between um, these two um, uh, factors so that's actually a much easier way of going about the business um, I wanted to illustrate you know, really both ways in which you can um, test the individual parameters. Um, obviously, it's a little bit more involved to go through the manage uh, models option, um, but um, you, know, you, you do kind of need to understand uh, the, the process of invariance testing uh, with respect to the individual parameters, and then uh, to, uh, a quicker version of that would just simply to be to go through analysis properties and click on that critical ratios for differences and then that, that will give you a quicker uh, test of um, for uh, invariance um, rather than going through that manage groups option or uh, the uh, manage models option. So at any rate that pretty well concludes this discussion and I hope you find this useful.